and welcome to Stories of Scotland, a podcast about stories of Scotland. I'm Jenny Tweedledum. And I'm Annie Tweedledee. And in this episode, we're taking a meandering trip down the marvellous River Tweed, winding across southern Scotland. The Tweed oftentimes delineates the border between Scotland and England. We are right at the edge of our Stories of Scotland limits here, Annie. It feels strange to be so far south, but I have been really enjoying our time in the borders. And how could we take a wander down here and not find ourselves on the banks of the Tweed? These waters are world famous for salmon fishing. So shall we cast out our lines and see if we can hook a slippery story or two? Yes, let's do that, Jenny. I love a bit of fishing. Oh, (laughs) and it looks like there's something wriggling on my line. Let me reel it in. (laughs) Look, Jenny, I caught a poem. That was fast, Annie. It's all in the wrist action, Jenny. (laughs) And I make my own flies with feathers. This poem was written by Roger Quinn. He was born in the borders in 1850. And while he travelled through much of Scotland, busking and writing his poems, the Borders was always the place that he called home. Quinn was known as the Tramp Poet, and this little selection of verses was written in Glasgow, possibly when he was in a poor house, reminiscing on the gentle hills of Galashiels, which must have seemed like another world at that time. From the moorland and the meadows, to this city of the shadows, where I wander old and lonely, comes the call I understand. In clear, soft tones enthralling, it is calling, calling, calling. Tis the spirit of the open from the dear old border land. Marvellous. I can't wait to float down the tweed. Just a quick thanks to our sponsors of this episode, Scotland Shop. Scotland Shop make beautiful tartan clothing with a story behind every product. And your tartan garments can be custom made to fit your body shape. While based in the borders, their tartans are available worldwide. Follow the link in the episode description and see their wide range of tailored tartan clothing and fabrics. There are over 500 clan tartans to choose from. 500! And you can make a virtual appointment for some personal service from the comfort of your own sofa. Your own sofa! Jenny, I think you'd look great in one of their tailored suits. I agree, Annie. I'll head over to Scotland Shop via the link in the episode description after the show. But for now, let's get back to the borders. The River Tweed's source flows from a small spring named Tweed's Well in the Lowther Hills of the Southern Uplands. A drop of rain that falls on the surrounding grassy knoll or in one of the nearby commercial forestry blocks is in for quite the journey back to the ocean. So what would you rather be on this journey, Annie? A drop of water amongst friends or a spruce needle floating atop this babbling burn? Is there a different option? I'm not feeling particularly attached to either of these. Um, you could be a grain of sand eroded from the ancient bedrock by the force of water and gravity working upon you over millennia. I mean, yes, this piece of sand, the way you've described it, really fits my god complex. Um, (laughs) Plus, I'm quite dry. I like the idea of just being a piece of rock. Just being a piece of rock? Annie, there's no such thing as just a piece of rock. Every rock has a story to tell, a story more epic than anything Marvel has ever made, a story of transformation and tension and pressure from the core of the planet to the tip of the highest mountain, a story of blistering heat and biting cold, of building and breaking and becoming again and again and again. 
Each rock has been on a journey that spans millions, even billions of years and stretches thousands of miles across not just the surface of planet Earth, but deep under it too. Oh, Annie, there's no such thing as just a rock. Well, when you put it like that, Jenny, I'm even more excited to be this grain of sand. All right. Well, if you're going to be sand, I am going to have to extend this story. By how much? Probably about 460 million years. Oh, I might regret this then. Impossible! Rocks don't have regrets. They only ever look forward. Rocks also don't have to edit this podcast, Jenny. (laughs) No, they don't have a clue about sound levelling. But the grain of sand that you are does have an epic tale to tell. We don't know when exactly your story begins, but let's jump in around the same time that plant life was inching out of the ocean and colonising the barren, lonely landscape some 460 million years ago. While life in the oceans is thriving and has been for about 3 billion years or so, this is the beginning of life on land, The beginning of planet Earth as we know her today. And you were there. But get your trunks on, Annie, because just as life is coming out of the ocean, you are heading back in. With little vegetation on the surface, erosion from wind and water, ice and gravity all break down the exposed rock really easily. And you have been wiggled loose from your home on a rugged plain and gradually carried to the Iapetus Ocean by a long and meandering river system. You float and roll around a little before settling on the continental shelf. This is making me feel really old. I (laughs) just want you to know that. Anna, you don't look a day over half a billion years old. Oh, thank you. Well, (laughs) hello world. I'm now a grain of sand. Hello, Annie. Now, no pressure, but there's a lot of pressure here. Oh no. And there's also loads of submarine avalanches. Ah. And sharks. Oh no. (laughs) Just kidding. Sharks aren't around for another 20 million years or so. I'm not sure if I was really that afraid of the sharks as a piece of sand. I'm not sure what they could have done to me, but I'm glad that it's just me in the ocean right now. Well, you and the ocean and the avalanches and the pressure, because they're all very real. Ah! (laughs) See, the build-up of sediments that you are now a proud part of is sitting on the edge of the continental shelf. And soon, in a huge torrent of mud, sand and rock fragments, you are swept down the edge of the shelf onto the deep abyss of the ocean floor. And here... You are subsumed under layer after layer of further avalanches, and the pressure is on. Over a heavy 70 million years, you and your companions become very close indeed. So close, in fact, that under the pressure from above, you cement together and form a dense, compact, sedimentary rock called Greywack. And it is this Greywack that you will slide away from 400 million years in the future in Tweed's Well, just north of the town of Moffat. But there are far more pressing things on your monolith mind right now, like... Is it just me, or is the ocean we're forming under getting, like, way smaller? It is not just you, Greywack Annie, well observed. The Iapetus Ocean is closing. The slow yet persistent grind of plate tectonics is driving two plates together, resulting in the sea between them being subsumed, or, in your case, being scraped up and eventually raised out of the ocean and upwards into a great mountain-building event known as the Caledonian Orogeny. This monumental geologic event brings together the fundamental pieces of the landmass we call Scotland, slotting the jigsaw of varying rocks and faults together as we see them today. It also brought Scotland and England together, 
and you, Greywack Annie, sit right between them. Out from under the ocean, but still below the equator. There is a long way to travel yet, but plate tectonics stop for no rock. Millimetre by millimetre, you move northwards. Through different climates you climb. High above you on the surface, soil forms. Fungi spread. Life lives and dies in endless spirals of evolution. Trees grow, dinosaurs roam and roar. Meteors hit, volcanoes erupt. The Atlantic Ocean opens to the west. And finally, about two million years ago, Scotland reaches its current position. You sit at the far-flung edge of a continent, and an ice age is upon you. Sheets of ice kilometres thick ebb and flow, retreating and reforming for hundreds of thousands of years. The ice scours the high mountains created in the Caledonian orogeny, and while not unfamiliar with erosion, this is a whole new ball game. The end result is the dramatic highland landscapes we know well today. But you are further south than this. Ice shapes you too, but you are also in a smaller mountain with weaker rock, and over time the surface above you is scraped away by glaciers. You become smooth and rounded, and are closer to the surface than you have been in over 460 million years. When the ice finally melts for good around 10,000 years ago, glacial till remains and blankets you. The glacial meltwater flows seawards to the east and in doing so forms the beginnings of the River Tweed. You sit right at the source of this beautiful river. Congratulations, you made it. How do you feel? A bit grand down, washed out. (laughs) Ah, but you're not totally washed out just yet. But don't worry, compared to your previous journey around the world, this part is a doddle. Lie back and relax as the gently tumbling waters of the River Tweed carry you eastwards towards the North Sea. For the next 97 miles, you bob through narrow, steep-sided valleys covered in heather and gorse gently swaying birch trees waving as you float by. Rounded hills pass while tributaries join. Soon small settlements flank the sides of the widening river. Old mills cast shadows on your waters. Dog walkers pass over bridges and between countries, stopping a moment to breathe in the softness of your surroundings. An invisible line divides you in two, Scotland on one side, England on the other. But the waters flow lazily on, not caring for such trivialities. You see castles and caravan parks, motorways and playgrounds. Oh, how the world has changed since you last passed through. And who knows where it will be when you see it next. For just like that, A lighthouse blinks farewell as you are cast once more out into the ocean. In time, you will settle on the continental shelf and become part of something bigger once more. I'm actually looking forward to the next 460 million years, Jenny. Our (laughs) podcast might get a couple of more listeners by then. (laughs) At the rate we're going, we'll probably be on episode 100. (laughs) We humans live life at warp speed compared to rock. We zip and zap around and rarely realise that we are but a blink in the story of the stone we live upon. And so, the next time you find yourself sitting on the banks of a gently flowing river and you drop your egg and cress sandwich and it gets covered in gravel and sand, take a moment to appreciate the unfathomably long journey each grain of sand has been on to ruin your lunch. I mean, that's that's weirdly specific, Jenny. 
Yeah, I dropped my sandwich on my lunch walk the other day. <laughs> did you not just scrape the sand off? I did, I did, but it was, you know, no one wants a crunchy egg crisp sandwich. No, that's not <laughs> ideal. <laughs> so from the story of an eccentric piece of sand on the River Tweed... We're going on a hunt for a bit of an eccentric lost soul of history. We're going to be stepping into Arthurian legends and looking at the wizard Merlin of the Tweed. So Jenny, do you know your Arthurian legends? (laughs) Do I know my Arthurian legends? Of course I know one of the most famous Welsh, British legends of all time Annie I didn't spend 45 minutes googling it because I had no idea what the round table was <laughs> how did you not know what the round table was Jenny oh I, you, I've heard it my whole life but I don't it, it, it just reminds me of Monty Python that's all that comes to mind and I don't think that even has anything to do with Arthurian legends <laughs> <sighs> but from my deep dive I can tell you that Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table are the reason all our best hybrid animal monsters are extinct. When was the last time you saw a lovely big dragon in Camelot, Annie? Hmm. Those knights had no respect for endangered species at all. None. It's like the term wasn't even coined at the time. Okay. (laughs) So, Jenny, do you also know... Or Google the magical Merlin of Arthurian legend. Of course, he is Gandalf of the Middle Ages. <laughs> well, Jenny, the Arthurian legends are stories that evolve around the world of King Arthur. And they are some of the most famous legends of all time. And certainly the biggest British legend that still shapes our fantasy worlds to this day. They sometimes blend real historical figures that we don't know very much about and just completely pump them up with Celtic mythology. And then, of course, sometimes the figures are complete figments of imagination. They mix in layers of medieval romance and Christianity you get the saints entering into the world of Arthurian legend too. When you get the particularly romantic Arthurian legends, they seem a little bit like a, a false utopia with really clear divides between what is good and what is evil. But there are many of the characters, including Merlin, who kind of stir this up. Now, Merlin is known today as simply being a wizard. And being the wizard who mentored King Arthur in making some good choices and who used his magic to help Arthur uphold his power. That's what I said, Annie. Well, the (laughs) legend of Merlin and the River Tweed is a bit of a rough patch for our wizard. During this section of mythology, he was going through what is well known as a Merlin of the Wild phase. Ah, I empathise with this. I was Jenny of the Wild before I was wrangled into a desk job. I miss her greatly. (laughs) Yes, your wilderness mountain phase is very similar to this period for Merlin. I'm just going to throw in a wee disclaimer about our Merlin legend here. We've got a few different wizards going on, but what's connecting them all and what merged them all, essentially is it's a wizard character around the River Tweed. And so a lot of people throughout history have been merging the stories to say it's speaking about the same character. So we basically put all the wizards in a blender and made a sorcerer's smoothie here. Yes, it's a Merlin milkshake. (laughs) My milkshake brings all the wizards to the Tweed and they're like waiting in the reeds. Dang right, it's the days of yours and Merlin. But I like the outdoors. (laughs) 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 
And who said you didn't know Arthurian legend, Jenny? <laughs> okay, so let's get into why Merlin has gone into the stunning natural environs of the Tweed. The main ingredient in our spellcasting cocktail comes from Geoffrey of Monmouth, who was a 12th century cleric and chronicler from Wales, of course. Our cocktail is topped up with a sprinkling of Merlin-type legends from throughout the medieval period. However, sometimes our Merlin goes by a different name in these stories. Ah, wizards always have a variety of names. It adds to the mystique. That's why I have two middle names. No, Jenny, you have two middle names because you went to private school. (laughs) (laughs) That's right, yeah, that's the only requirement for getting in. (laughs) Do you know how many middle names I've got, Jenny? Oh my god, do you have none? I have none. You have none, that's that's because you dropped out of school, Annie. (laughs) (laughs) She's not lying, I left school at 16. This is the disparity. (laughs) Anyway, Merlin clearly had a brilliant education because listen to these names. We've got the original Welsh, Merthyn. And then in the Scottish borders, we're calling him Merlin of the Caledonians. And then also, Lelokin. Oh, I like Lelokin the most. It's got a nice mouthfeel. Yes, Lelokin, again, I think is coming from the Welsh I'm so happy that we are incorporating some Welsh mythology today because I love old-fashioned Celtic connections. For the sake of ease, let's maybe just stick to calling our wizard Merlin of the Wilds. Does he also change the colour of his robes like Gandalf? Um, he becomes Merlin the Naked in a minute, but we'll get to that (laughs) soon. (laughs) First, let's begin with the Battle of Ardurid. This is a 6th century battle, so there's very limited information about it. This is a time when the British Isles were divided into lots of wee areas ruled by different monarchs and leaders. Nowadays, when we look at these territories, they seem to be more regional. But you know what? I'm not sure our governance is that much better nowadays, so maybe these little regional monarchies worked. Maybe they did. There's only one way to find out. Break up Scotland, independent highlands. (laughs) (laughs) And since this is a 6th century battle, I'm going to use my crystal ball of gazing into the past to discern what happened. On one side of the Battle of Ardurid, coming out of the mystic shadows of time, we have, unsurprisingly, the King of Ardurid. This king rules over a gorgeous chunk of southwest Scotland and northwest England. In the court of Ardurid, Merlin holds a place of authority. In the smokes of time, he appears to be a bard or an entertainer, possibly a second-rate stand-up comedian. He was a bard, Jerry. He was a bard. I could see him having a few good sets and a few terrible sets. In one place, I did see someone suggest he could be a jester. So I know you're saying this as a joke, Shani, but you know, you're... I never joke, Annie. Your gazing ball might be (laughs) strangely (laughs) accurate. Well, Annie, from magical prophecies and reading the assumptions made by historians, I've divinated that standing against Ardurid, we have the ruler of Alt Clut, which has territory in Strathclyde. Though my ball tells me that the past is uncertain, and indeed, there could have been a few alliances formed to make this a battle a bit more epic. I'm just going to highlight that though your past-telling methods are novel and not conventional, they really do reflect the struggle of trying to make sense of medieval accounts. Okay, call it novel, Annie. I took a crystal ball glazing class in my private school for six credits, so what are you going to (laughs) do? Though the details of the battle have been washed away by the rivers of time, we know that there was blood and death. A symphony of axes and swords, spears and shields. 
And in this clashing of half-forgotten armies, the king of Ardurid was slain. The old beliefs of the Ardurid soldiers summoned up their ancient guardian of the underworld, who took their king to the glens beyond this realm. And in the background, our bard Merlin looks on in horror as his king has fallen and he sees his own future turn to dust and ash. The trauma of this battle changes Merlin, first in his mind and then in his powers and his abilities. So the translations of the sources tend to discuss this period for Merlin as a madness or a melancholy. My favourite line of a translation from the perspective of Merlin, this wizard says, Have I been wandering in the gloom with the fairies? Which I think shows really well the sadness that has overcome Merlin the breakdown of his sanity and the way that he is embracing the supernatural. All accounts agree that after the battle, Merlin is completely changed. He retreats to the Caledonian forest and becomes a hairy, naked, prophet druid type. He becomes Merlin of the Wilds. To quote... He was formed like a freak, all his four quarters, and then his chin and face, haired so thick, with hair growing so grim, fearful to see. It is clear that by this point, he was a marvellous sight of oneness with the hairy forest. Yeah, no, Annie, I'm really drawing the parallels between our lives right now. (laughs) But this is also when Merlin becomes really wizardy, closer to the Merlin that we know nowadays. Well, the story goes that Kentigern found Merlin wandering in the Caledonian forest. Kentigern is more commonly known as Saint Mungo. Ah, the patron saint of Glasgow. Woo, represent. But yes. Kentigern stumbles across big old fuzzy wuzzy Merlin of the Wilds amongst the grand majesty of the Caledonian Oaks. Kentigern is intrigued by this prophet living with the animals and so he decides to approach him and speak to him. Merlin reveals a dreadful secret to the saint and confesses that he was responsible for all of the slaughter that occurred at Ardurid, for all of the lives lost and the souls that passed away. Merlin believed that he himself should have died, but had been driven forth by heaven to dwell amongst beasts until the day of his death. I would be really interested for someone out there to look at the psychology of this wizard. Just the guilt that Merlin is encountering because he survived the battle of Ardurid and then clearly the trauma that has caused him to alienate himself from any kind of community. But in this story, we're also looking at the Christianization of Britain. Yes, this is the classic Christian Saint Kentigern versus archaic druid Merlin of the Wilds. On one hand, we have the saint representing the order and power of the medieval church. And on the other hand, we have Merlin and the tangled, hairy chaos of nature. However, one of the finest tales of Merlin of the Wilds is the triple death prophecy. Why foretell just a singular death when you can have a triad? Essentially, Merlin's sister wanted to fool her brother into making false prophecies, to discredit him and his powers. So, she disguised her servant boy, you know, put him in a different tunic and a fake beard made of goat shavings, and sent him to see Merlin and ask the wizard to look into his future and tell him how he would die. Merlin consulted his magic stones and came to a grave conclusion. 
he responded to the fake goat bearded boy that he would die by rock. The servant boy returned to Merlin's sister and told her this, but she was not finished, for she gave him a different disguise. Perhaps this time it was a wig made from some old straw and a smoking pipe to make him look distinguished. The servant returned to Merlin and asked him once again how he would die. Merlin looked to the stars for astronomical guidance, where he could see the future as clear as the light of a full moon. And Merlin explained to the pipe-smoking boy that he would die by tree. And so the wee lad went back to Merlin's sister once more, and this time she put him in a final disguise. She painted a monobrow on his face with some charcoal and tied a pretty ribbon in his hair to make him look jolly. The monobrowed jolly boy found Merlin and begged him to tell him of the end of his days. Merlin looked sadly upon the large eyebrowed youth and remorsefully told him he would die by water. On this news, Merlin's sister was certain that her brother was a false prophet. He could have no gift of the second sight, because the fake bearded, pipe smoking, big eyebrowed boy were one and the same. He could not die three different ways. She had proven her brother to be a liar and a fraud. But in a giant plot twist, a series of very unfortunate events for the servant boy showed that Merlin's predictions had in fact been completely accurate. The servant boy found himself crossing over a river one day, smoking on the pipe he had been given as a prop for he had now become accustomed to it, when all of a sudden he slipped on the rock under his foot. He was impaled on a broken branch and then lay bleeding in the river, eventually drowning. Thus, he died by rock, tree and water. It was ye oldie triple threat. There's a variation of this. Rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> a twist to the triple death prophecy that doesn't depend on humorous costumes and disguises. <laughs> much less theatrical, I have to say, and much less enjoyable. So in this version, Merlin had foretold that his own death would be by rock, wood and water. And this does come to pass when Merlin runs into some shepherds. Remember that Merlin is living amongst animals for a long time and in many descriptions he's naked and people see him more like a beast than like a man. They really dehumanise Merlin of the wilds. And so when the shepherds see Merlin, they are incredibly fearful of him. And so they throw stones at him, and this injures our poor wizard greatly. A rock slams into Merlin's head, and in a state of concussion, he slips and falls into the river Tweed. Poor Merlin is then stabbed through his body by a stake of wood that has been holding a fishing net in place and bleeds out into the river. Would have been better with a straw wig. I'm not going to deny that. He could have been naked, but for a straw wig. <laughs> <laughs> that is a very different kind of podcast, Jenny. <laughs> so, the prophecies of Merlin are sometimes baffling and sometimes amazing. But the more we look into it, the more resemblance we can see to the archetype wizard that we can recognise in modern fantasy pop culture. From Gandalf to Yoda. Yoda used the force, he was not a wizard. There's parallels. <laughs> it's a wizened person who has touched power beyond that of the physical realm. Perhaps someone whose mortal mind is in a struggle to contain the knowledge of the greatest secrets of the universe. Yeah, like, the, the more you think about it, the more you see Merlin reflected across all of these kind of 
eccentric mentor figures that we see in media nowadays. Anyway, back to our wizard milkshake. There's a Victorian poem based on the medieval tale, and it's interpreting Merlin's existence in the Caledonian forest. Would you like to read it, Jenny? Yesterday, when I was wandering, o'er the broad law's treeless back, came a mist, a white mist floating, slowly o'er the moory track. And ever as it travelled lightly, where the fitful breeze might be, it took new shapes of strangest seeming that looked weirdly upon me. Now a whale, and now an ostrich, with a neck of longest span, now a camel, now a white bear, now a snowy locked old man. And I thought on old man Merlin, Merlin, wizard o' the tweed, moaning o'er the twee cleft kingdom, wailing o'er his waning creed. Merlin old, his bard and prophet, cleaving to the Kimrick creed, moaning o'er the lost sun worship, wandered lonely by the tweed. And finally, what happened to our Merlin of the Wild? So many of the sources we've seen reference this funny little folk poem to tell us where he ended up. The earliest version I've come across was written down in 1715 and was just a collection of local knowledge on the area. So it's clearly a little bit older than that. And just a little reminder for anyone learning Scots, the word burn means stream. A little further down is the town of Dromelia with a church. There is one thing that is remarkable here, which is the burn. The burn, called Pausale, runs by the east side of this churchyard into the Tweed. At the side of this burn, a little below the churchyard, the famous prophet Merlin is said to be buried. The particular place of his grave, at the root of the thorn tree, was shown to me many years ago by the old and reverent minister of the place, Mr Richard Brown. Here, at this place, the old prophecy was fulfilled. When Tweed and Pulsale meet at Merlin's grave, England and Scotland shall one monarch have. This prophecy came to pass on the very same day that our King James the Sixth of Scotland was also crowned King of England. On this day, the River Tweed faced an extraordinary flood and so overflowed its banks that there it met and joined with the Pulsail Burn and the said grave of Merlin. This was never before observed to flood to such a degree and nor since that time has been seen. So here we have a really intriguing wee acorn of folklore that has rooted and for over 300 years we keep seeing the same direction pointing to Merlin's grave under a thorn tree on the banks of the Tweed. Just a quick thanks to our sponsors of this episode, Scotland Shop. Scotland Shop make beautiful tartan clothing with a story behind every product. And your tartan garments can be custom made to fit your body shape. While based in the borders, their tartans are available worldwide. Follow the link in the episode description and see their wide range of tailored tartan clothing and fabrics. There are over 500 clan tartans to choose from. 500! And you can make a virtual appointment for some personal service from the comfort of your own sofa. Your own sofa! Jenny, I think you'd look great in one of their tailored suits. I agree, Annie. I'll head over to Scotland Shop via the link in the episode description after the show. 
But for now, let's get back to the borders. Perhaps one of the most famous associations with the River Tweed is the textile of the same name. So I think of Tweed and Tartan to be in the same family of incredible Scottish fabrics. While Tartan is a distinct pattern, Tweed is a type of cloth. It's a hard wearing, durable woven fabric which was traditionally woven in a twill pattern. And so that's a stepped pattern, which could be a zigzagging herringbone, hound's tooth, or even a plaid. Tweed is usually woven from wool and is distinct from other woven materials as the wool is dyed raw, so before it's been spun. And this means that lots of colours can be blended before the wool is turned into yarn, creating a really rich, deep, textured colour in the finished product. So tell me, Annie, how did this fabric get its name? Well, it's an interesting one because it's not always been called tweed. It was originally called twill, which is Scots for twill, just referring to the pattern again. Ah, yes, and the River Tweed was a great location for twill mills, as they could draw energy from the river via water wheels, which powered machinery. Plus, there was ample wool available from the sheep kept on the hills and moors of the borders. And the close proximity to Edinburgh was always good for trade. So twill was produced in large quantities along the River Tweed. And it's exactly this twill from the Tweed that gave the material its name today. But this is not because of the expected origin. Um, I find a bit of a dubious origin story of the name, but I, I think it's quite commonly accepted folklore, but it's also quite adorable, so we're going to look at it. Um, this is a version from the Dundee Evening Telegraph in 1940. There's an interesting legend of how Tweed came to get its name. In bygone days, Scottish cloths were known as Tweel, native version of Twill. One day, in 1840, a London merchant, James Locke, received a consignment of cloth from Hoyk in the Scottish borders. In the invoice, it was described as twill, but the word was hurriedly and not too clearly written. As twill came chiefly in those days, as it still largely does, from towns near the border river, tweed seemed an appropriate name for the consignment, in any case, Mr Locke misread the L for a D and thus christened the cloth Tweed, the name that has stuck to it ever since. And so, from a tale mixing weaving, geography and poor penmanship, Tweed got its name. And it's stuck ever since. It makes a lot of sense for the fabric name to be associated with a river because water was so essential for the processing, dyeing and setting of the fabric. But as we've learned today, the river tweed was also essential in making the fabric of mythology and in some ways the textile of Jenny's geological education. Well, of course, it wove together the parts of Scotland as they are today, geologically speaking. <laughs> And so, dear listeners, we have come to the mouth of the River Tweed. And what an odd journey it has been. Uh, but I have really enjoyed this episode. From the journey of the rocks to a strange, hairy, wild man, it's got everything I love in it. The River Tweed is one of Scotland's great rivers. And if you are ever driving through the borders, be sure to stop by its banks and look for a hairy wizard in the forests. And hold on to your sandwich. Make sure you're not dropping that. Thank you so much for listening to our wee podcast. If you don't already, please subscribe to the show. And while you're at it, why not give us a cheeky little five-star review? Because we absolutely love receiving them and reading them. And a massive thanks to all of the support from people on Spotify 
who gave us a tremendous amount of reviews in a very short time. Yes, there's little more you can do to help out your two favourite independent podcasters more than a wee five-star review. Uh, But the little more that you can do is support us on Patreon. For the price of a new gravel-free egg and crisp sandwich a month, you can really help Annie and I as we research, write, record, edit and release this podcast. You also get access to lots of little stories, myths and more. So a massive thank you and hello to all our newest patrons. Gary, Rosalind, Agnes, Melinda, Elena, Janet, Katrina, Megan, Lydia and Lindsay. Hello. I like to imagine you all as knights of the round table, bravely explaining to King Arthur that actually the dragon is an endangered species and you really don't want to kill it. You think we should marvel at its wonders and its beautiful scales and perhaps bring it gifts every now and again. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for supporting us and listening along. Until next time, Slanjava. Slanjava. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, I missed that. We're gonna have to do it again. Um, Pauline's Teams is on this computer, and I accidentally just joined a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to close it down, and I clicked OK. Okay, it's fine. And sharks. I mean, does sand really fear sharks? It's for the podcast, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's for the joke. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm on the edge of the continental shelf <laughs> and I'm hanging under an avalanche for you. I'm on the edge. Okay, okay so- let's just let's just bury that under a couple more layers there. <laughs> let's really <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't, How do you come after that? How do you come after that weird rock? Ardurid. 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 It's okay. an Ardurid life for us. <laughs> <laughs> it's an Ardurid. We're just butchering countless songs this episode. Yeah. All right. Okay, call it novel, Annie. I took a crystal ball glazing class in my private school for six credits. So what are you going to do? <laughs> my school didn't even have credits. I mean, I'm so <laughs> lost with the chasm of our experiences in the educational <laughs> system, Jenny. Why foretell just is why make foretell a particular saying or is that a typo? Yeah, that's that's a massive typo. Okay. Why make foretell doth sooth? <laughs> <laughs> the monobrow jolly boy. <laughs> <laughs> you thought you were gonna get me on the gold shavings, but I made it weirder. I love it. I love it. <laughs> oh my god, that was funny. <laughs> Merlin looked sadly upon the large eyebrowed youth. (laughs) (laughs) I think I think you might have to take it from uh, she painted a monobrow. Please don't make me say it again. I think you do. I think we ruined it. Okay. You can do it, Jenny. I believe in you. I've got all the faith. Received a consignment of cloth from Howick. Howick? Haywick. Hoik. 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 All right, just give me two seconds to uninstall Teams from this entire computer.